At the Grammy Awards 2024, Taylor Swift gathered us together and said, I would like to call a meeting, class in session. This is the sad person AGM. The board members, the trustees have been discussing, they have decided and would like to officially formally announce that 2024 is the year of the tortured poets. It is the year of appreciating poetry. And listen, I will do what I'm told. I will now be talking as much as humanly possible about great poetry that I think you should read. When I saw this album being announced, I was like, oh, yeah, this one's for me. This one is for booktube, like a song called The Manuscript, a bookmark for merchandise. Are you kidding me? I am about to be insufferable, <laughs> or at least more so than I already was. This is my new substitute for a personality. Like the tortured poets department is officially my era. It's officially my identity. Thank you very much. And you know, Taylor Swift is no stranger to referencing literature in her work, which I have spoken about <laughs> once or twice quite extensively, but all that to one side, I do feel like poetry is one of those things that feels a little intimidating. It feels like one of those things where a lot of people don't really know where to start, like what a good entry point is to exploring poetry and having fun with it. Especially because I think now when we think of poetry, we think of things that are either A, super elevated and not really that accessible, or on the other side of the spectrum, things that are very, very accessible. You know, the notes at poetry that we write at 3 a.m. about someone who's broken our heart, whether they know we exist <laughs> or not. I think that people have made that sort of synonymous with the idea of modern poetry. We think of people like Gabby Hanna. I think you're fat. Yeah, that's It's it. just my opinion. We also think of people like Rupi Kaur. When your fingers were dipped inside me, searching for honey, that would not come for you. I think that's where people's mind goes to when you say the words modern poetry. And I basically wanted to talk about some poetry that I think is really worth your time because there are so many extraordinary, talented, tortured poets who I think you should read. Now, before I get onto these, one thing I do always recommend as a good starting point is poetry anthologies, just because they introduce you to a ton of different poets, you know, a different poet on every page. It's like a little tasting platter. It's like poetry tapas where you get a little bit of everything. And then if you really like one particular poet, you can go away and buy one of their poetry collections. So just quickly, there is The Making of a Poem. This is the Norton Anthology of Poetic Forms, and it basically runs through the entire history of poetry with examples of each of the different forms. This is like what I studied for my degree. This one's a little more laid back. This is 365 Poems for Life. This is compiled by Ali Asiri, and it gives you a poem that matches up to the vibe of each day of the year. So it's kind of quite seasonal. If you just want to read a poem when you wake up or go to bed each day, there's also a Poetry Foundation who do a poem of the day every single day. You could go for a specific type of poem, like feminist poetry, this is 100 queer poems, or go for a specific time period, this is the Forward Book of Poetry for 2024. So I hope that kind of steers you in the right direction. But now, let's talk about these. First up, I wanted to talk about Bless the Daughter Raised by a Voice in Her Head. Firstly, what a cracking title, that is a banger and a half. Wilson Shire was the poet that Beyonce collaborated with for the Lemonade visuals. And this poetry collection is about her sort of stumbling towards womanhood, thinking about femininity and coming of age and tenderness, but also her relationship to her parents and her ancestry and what she descends from and her bloodline and also the locations in which that most strongly exists. Talking about femininity, there's this poem called Bless the Moon and she's kind of talking to the moon. So she says, forgive us, we blamed you for floods, for the flush of blood, for men who are also wolves. Even though you could pull the tide in by her hair, we tell everyone we walked all over you. We blame you for the dark, as if you had a choice, performing just beyond the glass, distant and adored, near but alone, cold and unimaginable, following us home. We use you to see our blue bodies beneath your damp light. We let you watch, swollen against the glass, as we move against one another like fish. I just think that is Gorgeous. These are the kind of poems you have to treat like hard-boiled sweets. You have to sit with them for a while, sucking on each one to get all the flavor out. Consume every part of it before moving on to the next. And a poem that I think about genuinely all the time is this one, it's called Home. This is more of a political poem, I guess, but like where the personal is political. It's about displacement, it's about exile, it's about seeking asylum, and the reasons that people would have to reach, the extremes people would have to reach in order to do that. So 
The poem will speak for itself. This is just one of those poems I will never ever forget reading. Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. The boy you went to school with, who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory, is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one would leave home unless home chased you. It's not something you ever thought about doing, so when you did, you carried the anthem under your breath, waiting until the airport toilet to tear up the passport and swallow, each mournful mouthful making it clear you would not be going back. No one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. No one would choose days and nights in the stomach of a truck unless the miles travelled meant something more than the journey. It's just, it goes on, but that gives you a kind of taste of the power of that poetry and how Wilson Shire really is a voice for our current age and our current dilemmas and I just think she's incredible. Now, sometimes poets just find the words to describe the exact way you feel. And I really think that about June Jordan. And this collection is called Haruko Love Poems. This is a book for the lovers. Let me read you one of my favorites from in here. This is called Poem for My Love. How do we come to be here next to each other in the night? Where are the stars that show us to our love inevitable? Outside the leaves flame usual in darkness and the rain falls cool and blessed on the holy flesh. The black men waiting on the corner for a womanly mirage. I am amazed by peace. It is this possibility of you asleep and breathing in the quiet air. I think it really captures that profound intensity that love and adoration can have. Just lying next to the person that you care about. And it's kind of that soft, tender, sweet love. You know, I think that love can be loud and it can be something that erupts out of you. It can be raucous, it can be wild, but also love can just be slow and soft. And I think that's what this really captures. And you know, it's not a naive collection. It still recognizes the racism and the prejudice and the injustices in the world at large. But instead of causing conflict with that world, she chooses to hurl words of love at it instead, you know? In amongst all this chaos, sometimes love is all we have. And I think that is what this collection is really about. She's kind of saying this world doesn't want me to love. It doesn't want me to be loved. And yet I will, you know, in spite of it all. And I will do so abundantly. And I just think that's so special. There is also this poem. It's called, It's About You on the Beach. You have two hands absolutely lean and clean to let go the gold, the silver flat, or plain rock sand. But hold the purple pieces, atom articles, that glorify a colour, yours is orange. Oranges are like you love, a promising, a calm skin, and a juice inside, a juice, a running from the desert. Lord, see how you run. Your body is a long black wing. Your body is a long black wing. So perfect. And the motif of an orange, of course, brings us on to talk about Wendy Cope. Now, Faber actually recently released this new collection of Wendy Cope's poetry called The Orange, which, you know, is kind of in response to the immense popularity of this specific poem, The Orange, which has gone quite viral on TikTok just because it's so lovely and it's kind of the kind of poem that you just want to wrap around your body in a warm embrace. It just feels like a blanket or like a hug. So this is The Orange, but I wanted to talk about this poetry collection specifically, Serious Concerns, because this is what made me fall in love with her writing. I think Wendy Cope just perfectly captures an appreciation for the simple, small things in life. You know, the subtle, ordinary pleasures of existence. Again, it's not about the grand gestures, it's about the little things, it's about the orange peel theory. And so let me find the orange in this collection. Come on, we have to read this one. One of my favourite poems of all time. At lunchtime, I bought a huge orange. The size of it made us all laugh. I peeled it and shared it with Robert and Dave. They had quarters and I had a half. And that orange, it made me so happy, as ordinary things often do, just lately. The shopping, a walk in the park, this is peace and contentment. It's new. The rest of the day was quite easy. I did all the jobs on my list. 
and enjoyed them and had some time over. I love you. I'm glad I exist. <sighs> oh my gosh, I have to show you my keys. I appreciate that sounds like a strange <laughs> stream of consciousness, but you'll see. So my friend Jordan and I love this poem so much that for Christmas she got me a quarter of an orange to go on my keys and she has one too and it's reminiscent of this poem. The idea that sharing a fruit, peeling an orange for someone is a small way of showing someone that you love them and that you care about them, you appreciate them, that you're thinking about them all the time and I bought a bunch of these and I'm just going to give them to everyone I care about because I think this is so lovely and this is a poem I think about regularly. And I love the power of poetry to remind us of these things, you know? Those final lines at the end, you know, they're monosyllabic but so powerful. I love you. I'm glad I exist. It almost makes me feel like I'm zooming out of my life for a second and getting to watch it from a bird's eye view and just thinking, yeah, it is pretty special, this, this whole thing. Any reminder of that? <laughs> I'm grateful for. Now, I feel like the obvious person to talk about next is Mary Oliver. If you're interested in thinking about venerating the beauty of the natural world, appreciating the things around us, thinking of nature as our greatest teacher, Mary Oliver is the person for you. I posted one of these poems on Instagram the other day and everyone loved it. Like, I had so many replies to this, so let me find it, you will love it too. Again, it is just about appreciating life, feeling present in the moment, taking a second to just be grateful, of things being pretty wonderful. So this poem is called If I Were. There are lots of ways to dance and to spin. Sometimes it just starts with my feet first, then my entire body. I am spinning. No one can see it, but it is happening. I am so glad to be alive. I am so glad to be loving and loved. Even if I were close to the finish, even if I were at my final breath, I would be here to take a stand bereft of such astonishments, but for them. If I were a Sufi, for sure, I would be one of the spinning kind. Again, just lovely. I found a lot of reassurance in her lines and in her verse, and I find myself returning to her whenever I feel uncertain about where I'm at, what I'm doing, who I am, you know? This one is called Lines Written in the Days of Growing Darkness. Every year, we have been witness to it, how the world descends into a rich mass, in order that it may resume. And therefore, who would cry out to the petals on the ground to stay, knowing, as we must, how the vivacity of what was is married to the vitality of what will be. I don't say it's easy, but what else will do if the love one claims to have for the world be true? And I like that idea, you know, especially right now in this you know, when it's the winter time and everything feels a little bit bleak, instead of mourning the leaves that were once on the trees, we should be celebrating the fact that they will come again. You know, we should be thinking not about what has disappeared from us, the beauty that is gone, but the beauty that we are yet to experience. And I think that's a really lovely sentiment and it's nice to just be reminded of that every now and then. Now, from one Mary to another, this is Mary Jean Chan. And this collection is called Bright Fear. It's actually split into three sections, firstly contemplating language and translation, the art of translating one language into another and what is lost and what is gained. And that is told from the perspective of the narrative voice, the poet who learned English as a second language, but now lives and works in the UK. So that is now the predominant language that she uses. Then it goes on to contemplate the transformative nature of poetry, so kind of meta in that way. And then it goes on to contemplate one's position within the family, specifically a nuclear family. You know, the weight of parental expectation, the way that the version of you that existed as a child is kind of a blueprint that is set up for you for the rest of your life. It's a framework you're expected to follow and actually often we do deviate from that and we do choose for our lives to go in different directions to maybe what the people who knew us as a child expected of us and that's okay. It's about confessing to her parents, it's about being an authentic version of her, it's also about the performance of, you know, when her parents come to visit her, the way that she kind of alters her life, changes her posture, changes the way that she speaks to accommodate for their expectations of her. And then there are also these threads that run throughout the entire collection. So for example, she's thinking a lot about queerness, as well as microaggressions against Asian people, specifically in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, when anti-Asian sentiment was horrible and harmful, but rampant and really proliferated during that time. So, um, what's a good example I can, 
find. This one is called EDI for Migrants Part 3. Post-colony is a state of mind. It is reaching deep into the past as you sit on a BA flight travelling across a genteel English landscape and history not reaching back. Neocolony is a state of being. It is the illusion of freedom until it is withdrawn ever so softly like a hospital curtain. The more you successfully assimilate, the more you see the terms and conditions, feel the texture of abstract nouns, equality, diversity, inclusion. So powerful. And within this collection, she also discusses the fluidity of the concept of home, how it can be a person just as much as it can be a place. This is a poem just called 16. Home, my therapist suggests, is where you don't have to explain yourself. Where is that place? Perhaps here is home, in the long poem of our lives, where she offers me a cup of freshly brewed oolong tea and I am moved to the scent of something bittersweet, where our thoughts spill over as I adore the warmth of your voice, where the afternoon light is so kind and the corgi lies fast asleep on our feet, where I begin to speak and you hear me unequivocally. So wonderful. Now, before we talk about the next poetry collection, I wanted to let you know that today's video is very kindly brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is a learning hub for curious and creative people, which if you are watching this video, I think probably applies to you. If you want to make sure that this is the year or this is the time of your life for self-growth and investing in yourself and the skills that you want to learn. Skillshare is a learning community designed for you. Whether you want to learn how to animate things or use a DSLR camera or even just keep houseplants alive, there is a course for absolutely everything. There are courses about being a better student or a better business person and the one that I'm currently taking is actually a learning path which is called Create and Promote Your Personal Brand with Zero Experience. So it's all about turning your side hustles in to a career in easy to follow steps. You can pick it up and do it at any time you want, which is great. And the learning path style works really well because the lessons sort of build on one another. So it's kind of a logical way of learning something. And the best news is the first 500 people who clicked my link in the description box will receive a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can try out all the classes, find one that inspires you, and yeah, enjoy. So thank you so, so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now, these next couple of collections also think about the diaspora and the concept of home. This one is called Bad Diaspora Poems, and it's smart because there is nothing bad about this collection at all. I think maybe it should instead be read as Bad Diaspora poems because the word bad is the only word that is a lie here in this entire book. It is excellent. It contemplates identity, the art of poetry, class, immigration, and also translation. In this collection she says, we were not made to endure. You know, we were made to live, not just to survive. And I think she has a really unique poetic voice, which dissects the notion of the diaspora in these a, exquisitely lyrical, but B, brutally painful ways. I was underlining on every single page. This one here is called Gradations. Above the city, a stone-throwing boy is raised. They said no sky on earth was as cloudless as ours, none as blue. Two leopards wag their tongues. A shield of gold between them, another luminous lie. Summon the golden age through the rose-tinted filter of its inheritors. Describe the shade of your ache. Who does an age belong to? Whose brooch once winked in the sun? Whose children sheltered under a nation's promise? Who was close and who was closer? Who was left squinting with nothing but the ink of a flag staining their fingertips? An inventory of half-remembered songs. Who lost so little, having already had so little to lose. That last line, who lost so little, having already so little to lose, I think is sheer poetic 
perfection. And also concerned with the notion of diaspora is this collection. This is Heritage Aesthetics. This is by Anthony Anaxagoro, and it contemplates colonial structures and divisive histories. It is about the deep wounds that the British Empire has left, specifically on Cyprus, which is the kind of motherland for this writer, despite now living in the UK. So there is that feeling of being torn between two things, between two cultures, between two countries, and also between the past and the present. All of his insights and observations are complicated by the fact that he's always sort of towing that line. And I think one thing the collection does exceptionally well is these sudden gut-wrenching lines. You get kind of emotional whiplash. You're like flowing through this gorgeously silky smooth poem and then all of a sudden, bam, there's this one line that knocks the wind out of your lungs. For example, it's hard to accept that this is the life will die in. Or in a few hours, a man will walk down a street in Birmingham to drive a knife into a person he's never heard laugh. That got me. That one got me good. You know, when you juxtapose these moments of violence and brutality with personality and humanity and the individual who is the victim, this one is called No Such Thing. Call me. They buried him on his birthday when you get this. My mother by his grave, her phone panning the ground, knowing he'll keep that same patch of earth for all his troubles until there's no such thing as us. I replayed the video she sent. I need to tell you something, 47 times. I know this because I counted. Her sound, holding her breath, I could hear it wanting to soak the spines of condolence cards her dead, your uncle, brother. I'll walk those years for you, lining them with ski slopes. Kentish Town, Moss Side, Bram Hall. I remember, even though urban kids are terrible at knowing what to do with their precious ruins, it's there for a second then. Died last night, ere his heart. The absence of a body is not the absence of memory. No matter what we do for it, this life will never need us twice. Again, that closing line will stay with me forever and ever and ever. No matter what we do, this life will not need us twice. Like, oh, wow. Next, we have Mahmoud Darwish, one of my favorite Palestinian poets. I made a whole video of Palestinian book recommendations over on my second channel if you would like to check that out. But every time I talk about Darwish's work, I am inundated with comments of people telling me, if only you could read the Arabic because it is even more excellent, even more brilliant and even more phenomenal. It's like being told that the tastiest apple is hanging right in front of you and knowing you'll never get to taste it. But the English translations are also excellent. This book here was translated by Catherine Cobham from Arabic. And these are actually his diaries from 2006 when Israel attacked Gaza and Lebanon. This one particular poem sort of speaks to the way that we get desensitized to seeing casualties in the news, you know, numbers, death counts, death tolls, how seeing that figure on a screen or in the paper just doesn't quite capture the trauma of the lived individual experience, you know? And on a granular level, I think this reminds us of what we lose when any person dies as a result of an oppressor and how shocking that oppression and violence truly is every single time. So this is called The Girl, The Scream. On the seashore is a girl, and the girl has a family, and the family has a house, and the house has two windows and a door. And in the sea is a warship having fun, catching promenaders on the seashore. Four, five, seven fall down on the sand. And the girl is saved for a while because a hazy hand, a divine hand of some sort helps her. So she calls out, father, father, let's go home. The sea is not for people like us. Her father doesn't answer, laid out on his shadow windward of the sunset, blood in the palm trees, blood in the clouds. Her voice carries her higher and further than the seashore. She screams at night over the land. The echo has no echo. So she becomes the endless scream in the breaking news, which was no longer breaking news. When the aircraft returned, to bomb a house, 
with two windows and a door. That one gets me every single time, and I think Mamu Darwish is incredible. Now, of course, I was not gonna make this video without talking about Ocean Vong. Come on. I mean, both of these collections, Time is a Mother and also Night Sky with Exit Wounds, firstly, what a title. This line here is <laughs> My Roman Empire. It's from the very first poem in the collection. It's a poem called Telemachus, and it's talking about his father dying and being confronted by that. And he describes seeing his father's face as he's dying, like this. I touch his ears, no use. I turn him over to face it. The cathedral in his sea-black eyes. The face, not mine, but one I will wear to kiss all my lovers good night. And I think that idea of what we inherit from our parents, you know, his father's face isn't his face, but he sees his reflection in it. He sees what he has inherited from his father in that face, and that he will then carry that legacy with him, and that those genes, those features, will be carried with him to all of the people that he goes on to meet, and I think that is so moving. That's one of those lines that I wish I had written, you know? Ocean Vong is just the king of imagery. So many lines from his novel also have stuck with me ever since I read it. I think his metaphors are just so delicate and beautiful. I wanted to read you um, something from Time as a Mother, but I would also highly recommend listening to him explain his own work on podcasts, in interviews. The way he speaks is just gorgeous. So this is a poem called Woodworking at the End of the World. It's quite long, so I won't read the whole thing, but this is kind of the final section. It's okay, the boy said at last. I forgive you. Then he kissed me, as if returning a porcelain shard to my cheek. Shaking, I turned to him. I turned and found, crumpled on the grass, the faded red shirt. I put it over my face and stayed very still, like my mother at the end. Then it came to me, my life. I remembered my life the way an axe handle, mid-swing, remembers the tree. And I was free. Not a word is wasted in these collections. He has such mastery over language. Ugh, just so good. Self-Portrait as Othello. This is by Jason Allen Payson, and it was nominated for and won a bunch of poetry prizes last year, and rightfully so, deservedly so, thoroughly deserved. As you know, I love books that are in conversation with other books, and this is one of them. It is very much in conversation with, of course, Shakespeare's Othello, and there's a constant dialogue there throughout. So the first half of the collection sort of tells a story through verse. It's kind of like a poetic memoir, if that's even a thing. I guess it is now. So I'll just read you the very first page just to give you an insight. So one, I am five. I sit on the barbecue, dangling my feet, chewing grass straw like brother B, boy following man. My heart races every time a car blows horn or pulls up, thinking, that must be my father, a him that come look for me, yes him come. The people fly past, and mama runs to look, and she stares and peers, and the people will not stop flying past, like the whirlwind, like the hurricane, but daddy was not in the wind. And his relationship with his father is one of the kind of core motifs of this book. It's a real crucial discussion point, kind of a bit of a center of gravity for the collection. And I think the collection as a whole is really about intersecting identities. It's about the black male body, it's about European urban landscapes. And I think I saw an interview where Jason Allen Paisant was talking about this, and he said that what he was looking to do is he sought to plant new seeds in terrain that had previously been colonized, had previously had other people claim ownership of that land, you know, he is implanting his own experiences as well now and growing from them. And I think he really succeeds in that mission, so I highly recommend this book. Okay, this one is called Survival Takes a Wild Imagination. And if you are into the kind of Rupi Kaur vibe, I would say that Fariha Roizin's poetry is sort of similar, but more elevated. Survival Takes a Wild Imagination is about generational trauma and bonds, but also borders, both personal and international. It is about trying to love people whilst also trying to forgive them. And it's also about loving a version of yourself that has been through so much that you no longer really recognize them. 
but you have to learn to. She says, I count the ways I love myself. I'm furthest from zero I've ever been. The poems are quite long, but I recommend Memories Rewritten. This is for everyone who had to make a family out of themselves. And also Paradise Girl, she's hard to find. There are some real gems in this collection. This is Survival Takes a Wild Imagination. And then finally, last but most certainly not least, this is On Sun Swallowing by Dakota Warren. I very nearly said Dakota Johnson then. I am not in fact friends with Madam Webb, but this is my wonderful best friend, Dakota, and this collection is so special. It's filled with these amazing photos and it really experiments with form and the way that the page can be used. There's one poem that I always return back to and I know it's just such a small one within this collection, but I just love it. The way it just rolls off the tongue, it's called 6.33 p.m. And she says, I'm thinking of phases and how I fill spaces and the places I want to dance in. And I just, I love it so much. It's about girlhood, it's about godhood, it's about youth and coming of age. It's vulnerable yet haunting and I really like this a lot. It feels like the sensation of reading by candlelight. It is a really great collection and a debut as well. So those are a bunch of poetry collections that I highly recommend, that I think are so worth your time. Indulge in them, enjoy them, underline them, annotate them, shout about them from the rooftops. I think these are just so excellent and I think they need to be part of your life, quite frankly. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget, you can find me on Instagram, on TikTok, on my second channel, on Goodreads, on the Storygraph, all over the place. Um, and I would love to see you there. So thank you so, so much for watching this video. Subscribe if you're new, and I will see you very, very soon. Bye-bye.